the light of the world, the theme for this Christmas season. And the theme verse from John chapter 8, verse 12. Throughout this Christmas season, we will be focused on John chapter 1, but the theme verse and where we'll begin today is John chapter 8, verse 12. This amazing setting that we see there in John chapter 8, it was in the midst of what the people of Israel had celebrated for many years and decades and centuries, which was known as the Feast of the Tabernacles or the Feast of the Booths. And so Jewish pilgrims from all over Israel would come at this time of the year to Jerusalem and gather there. And as they would, they would set up temporary structures in which they and their families would live for the eight days of this festival. And so if you can imagine seeing the scene, if you had set the scene in your mind with me, there upon all the hillsides and roadsides all over were these temporary structures built from sticks and grasses, whatever it might be for some of our hunters in this room. Imagine a large, fully enclosed duck blind for you and your family set up all over the countryside in this time. And you'd see these, these tabernacles, these booths, and the purpose of this was a remembrance of the fact that they too, as the people of God, the Hebrew people, wandered in the wilderness. But yet God was faithful to them. And through this understanding, there was great symbolism of of, of water, the living water. And in fact, just before this, in the chapter before, Jesus said, there as he was gathered in the midst of all of the people, he says, I am the living water. Incredible picture. But not only that night, but also we see, and not that time, but also in the context of what we're going to see here in John chapter 8, you imagine not only all, across all of the countryside, these tabernacles, these booths that were, that were put together and erected all over the countryside, all over the roadside, but the people together each night, as many that could cram in, would cram into a temple mount, much of what you'd see on the screen here. And if you can imagine this beautiful temple mound in this outer court known as the court of the women in which the women and the men could gather together. And you see these four great pillars there set in the midst of the court of the women and as people that could come through, those that could gather together, they would see on the top of these great pillars the candelabras that would be lit. And they'd have this great celebration as part of this feast and tabernacles, this promise of the light. That they'd seen all throughout the scriptures, all of the promise that they'd received from God, that light of salvation would come in the midst of the darkness of the world. You see, God created the, the world and all that we see around us, and it was good. But when sin entered the world, the world and all of us fell into darkness. And so they, during that temple celebration, they would celebrate the fact that, yes, light would come. They would stand in the midst of the court, stand in the midst of these great candelabras, and they would say and and speak out to God and the great promises of God that the light would come through their Messiah. And so this is the setting that we see for this great verse, John chapter 8, verse 12. And he says this, and again, Jesus spoke to them. Imagine Jesus standing in the midst of this crowd, this incredible gathered crowd there in the outer court of the temple, and he says, I am the light of the world. These people gathered as they had, many of them, year after year, decade after decade, as this feast had gone on for as long as they had known it. And maybe some of them standing in the exact place that they had stood for all those years, once a year, as they celebrated this this great festival. But now this year, something different. One from their midst. One that maybe whispers had been heard about this great man, Jesus. Conversations had been had about this teacher that had been healing people in the countryside. Is this real? Is this just uh, lore? Is something really happening here? And this one that had been promised from all these years, this one rather that had, been, that had been in their midst now for quite some time, he stood in the midst of this crowd and he said, I am the light of the world. This light that we'd been seeking, you'd been seeking as our people. He was saying, standing in the midst of his Jewish people, that's the light that we'd been seeking for, for days and years and decades and centuries. We've been searching for this. I am here. I am the light 
of the world. Now we see this taking place 30 years, 30 years plus into the life of Jesus, fully in the midst of his earthly ministry. But John, as he is writing his gospel, he doesn't begin there. He doesn't pick up the story as other gospel writers do, all under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Some beginning with John the Baptist, the forerunner of Jesus Christ. Some begin with great characters that we see of Scripture of Mary and Joseph and the lowly shepherds. No, John, under the inspiration of God, he rewinds and begins his gospel, his good news of Jesus at the very beginning. So turn with me now to John chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. And it says this, In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Verse 3 says this, All things were made through Him, and without Him not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Lord God, as we enter into this Christmas season, and as we go to one of the great pinnacle passages of all of Scripture, that we see that this Jesus who walked this earth wasn't just a great man. He wasn't just a great teacher. He wasn't just a great healer. He was certainly all of those things. But he was far more. Jesus, you were God on earth. You came to us, a Savior amongst your people. God, as we continue through and enter into this Christmas season, and as we go throughout our days, we are so, it is so easy to be distracted by the things of our world that do not matter. But God, help us to look for those opportunities around us that we might speak of the light that shines in the midst of darkness. That we might speak of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Once again, in verses 1 through 2, we see once more he says, In the beginning, in the beginning was the word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. In the beginning, there was never a time in which Jesus was not. Obviously, see, as we see through the context and the reiterated throughout these five verses here, this word, capital W, as many of you will see in your translations, speaks of none other than Jesus Christ. He is the Word, and it says here that He was in the beginning. Jesus always was. There was never a time in which Jesus was not. From the very beginning of the deep recesses of of history and eternity, there was never a time in which it contained Jesus. He was outside of time. In the beginning, He was there. Of course, we see not only, as we mentioned in in John chapter 8, That whole festival centered around the wilderness wanderings. But we see the great tie, not only in John chapter 8, but through all of the the, the look at the light and the life that we see here. It clearly ties back to the wilderness wanderings of, of God's Hebrew people and the promise that one day a Messiah would come. And do you remember even in Exodus chapter 3 as as God made himself appear to Moses in a burning bush and Moses is scared and as he's commissioned to go to the people, he says, well, who should I tell them has sent me? And God says, the I am that I am has sent you. And so when we see something like John chapter 8 verse 12, the theme verse for the entirety of this series, and Jesus says, I am the light of the world. It's not by mistake. In fact, it's one of the seven I am statements captured by John in his gospel. And it is a clear tie to the fact of saying that I am the God of the universe. 
The great I am that I am that appeared to our forefathers, appeared to the prophets of old, and appeared to Moses even in the burning bush who says, I am that I am. That's who I am. I'm God. He was in the beginning. Jesus always was. Really, in fact, a clunky but accurate translation of I am that I am is, could almost be captured in one very simple word, is. If we think of God as the I am that I am, we could say it, his name is is or be. He just simply is and exists. There's no beginning of God. There's no end to God. Therefore, no beginning of Jesus, no end to Jesus. He is outside of time and eternity. He simply is. In the beginning was the Word. The Word. Also, the Word, capital W, is a very important theme and word for the Hebrew people. It was a term they often used for God. Word, the Word, capital W, it speaks of His active power in creation simply by His speech. A great encapsulation of all the wisdom and all the creative power of God. Therefore, a label for Yahweh, for God, the Word. Psalm 33, 6 says this, in fact, by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. And by the breath of his mouth, all their host. So by the very word of God, all of the heavens and all of the starry hosts were spoken into existence. This word, the term many Jews use for God's capture, that essence of his active power. Not only that, was that one part, one great part of John's audience, but another part of his audience was also the Greeks, the Greek world at the time, the Greco-Roman world, and they understood a concept as well of the word. In their understanding, in their philosophy, they had this understanding of what was known as the word. Heraclitus, one of their philosophers, spoke of this idea of the word of ordering something that ordered the cosmos. The Stoic philosophers spoke of something that was a divine principle known as the world, the word throughout all of the universe. But John, speaking the truth that is outside time and eternity, brought those two ideas together and gave them even greater meaning, a meaning that existed outside of time and eternity as he, he the word, is that great wisdom that is now taken on human form. The Word has come to us. The Word was with God. With God, it says there. That phrase, that word means face-to-face -face relationship. Face-to-face -face relationship. This Word, this Jesus Christ, wasn't just a lowly servant in the throne room of God, somewhere huddled in the corner. No, this Jesus was face to face with God. This son was not just that, in fact. Not just face to face. It says there in the second phrase, he was God. Not just with God. Not just a face to face relationship with God. But God the Son, Jesus Christ, truly was God. Now, our Jehovah's Witness neighbors and Mormon neighbors will like to say, maybe they've been misinformed or they haven't understood. They will say, if they come to your door, you might hear them say, there's no article in the original Greek there. There's no ha, theos, in the Greek. There's no article. There's no the God. It just says theos. So therefore, it shouldn't be translated the God or God, but it should be translated a God. Now, not to bog us down too much, but there are many places throughout the Scripture where we see contextually it is clearly speaking of God, the God of the universe, and there's no article before the Word. And then we see contextually here as well. Clearly, clearly, this is speaking of the Word, capital W, is clearly Jesus Christ, and clearly saying the God. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. Folks, the first thing that we see here today is this. All of God is present in Jesus. All of God 
is present in Jesus Christ. You know, those of us who are parents might remember those times when maybe we first got home from the hospital with our child and laying there in in that crib and you were wondering, how in the world are we going to do this? We don't have the nurses helping us out anymore. Am I going to mess this up? Am I going to screw this up? And we see there laying in that crib all the beauty of that baby, but all the helplessness, all the vulnerability, needing us for its very life and protection. Can you imagine this? As you think about in that stable, lying in that manger, you see it even on our graphics package for this Christmas season. You know what a manger was? It was a feed trough for animals. So all of the slobber and all of the goo of all of those animals, and there the creator of the universe who spoke this world, those animals, the wood that made up that manger, lay there helpless in that very manger. Laying there before Mary and Joseph, they too thinking, how are we going to do this? And then on top of that, as it became increasingly clear, and as the prophecies of the angels that appeared to them began to set in more and more every day, this wasn't just a helpless baby, but here in our care, wrapped in flesh, is the creator of the universe. Can you imagine that? This is our God that has come to us. Jesus Christ Jesus Christ, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, it says in verse 2. Right there, laying in that manger, all of God is present in Jesus Christ. As John continues here, he says in verse 3, And all things were made through him, and without him nothing was made, was not anything made that was made little clunky in this translation, but ESV captures it perfectly. As stilted as that English might be, it is capturing that thing that's saying, not anything. There's no single thing in our universe. Try to name it. Not a single thing in our universe was made without the very care and the very word and the sustaining power of Jesus Christ. As one writer says, from subatomic particles to galaxies. All of it was spoken into existence by Jesus Christ. Colossians 1, 16 through 17, we know these well. Look at these powerful verses. For by him, that's Jesus Christ, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things and in him all things hold together. The very power of Jesus Christ, that one who spoke this world into existence out time, outside of time and eternity and space, he then wrapped himself in flesh and came to us. The second thing that we see here, write it down. Jesus is the creator and the savior of his very creation. He came to us. This world that he spoke into existence, we see again there early in the book of Genesis. Although it was created perfect, it was marred and it was destroyed and broken by sin. And we see that brokenness all around us. Romans 8, a whole of Romans 8, and we see in other places in Scripture as well, it says the very universe groans, waiting for the redemption of the sons of men, that it might be restored. One of the beauties that we see in the book of Revelation, our last study, also echoed echoed in 1 Peter chapter 2, is it's not as though we're going to be floating on a cloud somewhere for time and eternity in the presence of Jesus Christ. He says that when he returns, he will remake the heavens and the earth and we'll dwell in all eternity and heaven will be here, heaven come down. You see, God, he is the creator of, And in a sense, in our lives and in the entirety of the universe, he is creator, savior, and re-creator. So the first thing that we see, of course, is all of God is present in Jesus Christ. 
The second thing that we see is Jesus is the creator and the savior of his very creation. But then we also see here in verses 4 and 5, in him was life. In him was life. And the life was the light of men. This is where we draw the title of today's message from, Life and Light. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. This light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Not only does it say that the darkness did not overcome it, but you see from the context and the grammar there has not overcome it. It continues to have victory over this darkness. This life and light and the darkness did not overcome it. Life, we see this word, important word throughout, of course, all of Scripture, that God is the source of life. And for John as well, 36 is the first of 36 times that we see this throughout the book of John, throughout the Gospel of John. Life, so important. Light as well. We find new life. We find eternal life in the light. This light, in fact, in the way it's spoken, is not natural to humanity, but it's outside of humanity. We were created good and perfect in God's image, but yet we've been marred by sin. And so we need this light from the outside, outside of ourselves. Not only biblically, but also throughout ancient literature and ancient uh, belief systems all throughout the world, you see the importance of this idea of light. Near East gods, there were Near East gods of light and darkness. Uh, Re was the sun god of Egypt. Helios was a Greek god of chariots of light. But all of these ancient thought systems were merely trying to scratch and trying to grope and trying to find some purpose and try to find some understanding. But they came so woefully short. You see, all throughout ancient beliefs and philosophical systems and even throughout all of humanity up until this very day, we see this idea of this belief system or this religious leader or this particular thought process. This is the source of enlightenment. This is the source to unlock all that we see of enlightenment in your life and and, and understanding and whatever it might be. This is the source. But Jesus came into the world and he said, I'm far more than a source of enlightenment. I am the luminary. I'm the light. I'm the light. And in me, you find life. In the midst of darkness, it says. In the midst of darkness. Verse 5 talks about that darkness of the sin-ravaged world in which we live. But it says, as dark as it might seem and as hopeless as it might seem at times... He says that it has not, it will not, and it, and it is never going to overcome the light. Let's think the parallels. Just think about the parallels of the darkness that we would see. First of all, in the first century in which John was writing. John, of course, also the writer of the book of Revelation that we looked at in our last sermon series. Think about the challenges and the darkness and the evil that some of these churches of Asia Minor were dealing with. Just some of the absolute perversion of their cities, the violence of their cities, the greed of their cities, the persecution that they were facing. They were living in some places in which the darkness was pressing in. We think about the darkness that we experience only about a quarter of the way into the 21st century. Think about the darkness all around us. If we even just rewind the clock to the last full century that we've all experienced of the 20th century, 231 million deaths through war in the 20th century. Incredible. The darkness that we see across the history of the 20th century in the First World War and the Second World War and wars all across the the timeline of that century. And that's just one small piece of the darkness. First century to the 21st century, darkness of our world, but God tells us, but this darkness has not overcome the light. Folks, the third thing that we see here is no matter the darkness, no matter the darkness, the light of Jesus overcomes, no matter what the darkness might be. 
I love here one writer, one commentator, a, a name of Keo Gungel says this, Jesus Christ, the creator, provides physical life. Jesus Christ, the redeemer, provides spiritual life. And Jesus Christ, the savior, provides eternal life. In the midst of the darkness of our world, the darkness of your life, you may say, I'm feeling it pressing in. We have a creator, we have a redeemer, and we have a savior. You know, to one of those groups that John had in mind as he was writing his gospel, certainly the Hebrew people, I love to see the parallels between John chapter 1 and Hebrews chapter 1, the first few verses here. And the writer of Hebrews, whoever that might be, as many think it's Paul, some might think it's others, it's not very clear from the writing of that of Hebrews, but yet we see John had the Hebrew people in mind. Whoever the writer of Hebrews was obviously had the Hebrew people in mind. And we see this great parallel, both of those writers and the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 3 says this, Long ago, long ago, and at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. So again, the writer of Hebrews is speaking to his Hebrew brethren his Hebrew brothers and sisters, and he says, God spoke in many ways to our fathers by the prophets in time past. Verse 2, but in these last days, in these days of the church age since Jesus Christ has come, but in these last days, he that is God the Father has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom he also created the world. Verse 3, He, that is Jesus Christ, he is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. He is God. He is God. There's no bit of difference between the two. He is God. There's God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, and Jesus is God the Son. He's the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for the sins He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Jesus Christ, the word who was in the beginning, he was with God and he was God. And all that we see, there's not a single thing in our universe that was created, that was not created and is not sustained by Jesus Christ. That one came to his people. So folks, once again, No matter the darkness of our world, no matter the darkness of your life, Jesus Christ, the light, has overcome the darkness. I want to end in this way. Wonderful quote, great saint of old Augustine, beautiful capturing of the understanding of the Christmas season. He says this, look at it on the screen with me. Man's maker, man's maker was made that he, ruler of the stars, might nurse at his mother's breast, that the bread might hunger, the fountain thirst, the light sleep, the way be tired on its journey, that truth might be accused of false witness, the teacher be beaten with whips, the foundation be suspended on wood, that strength might grow weak, that the healer might be wounded, that life might die. The incredible truth of the Christmas season is that God is with us. He is the light of life. He has come to this world. He is the creator of this universe. He has created you. Will you let him save you and recreate you this day? Let's pray. Well, God, as we think about this unfathomable truth of the Christmas season, that not just did you save us, as tremendous and as awe-inspiring as that might be, but you came to us to save us. 
God, I pray today if there is someone here within the sound of my voice that does not know Jesus as their Savior and their Lord, Jesus, would you save them today? God, I pray for those of us that are here today that we know you, Jesus, as our Savior. But maybe we're just like the church there in the book of Revelation where we have lost our first love. So maybe there's someone today that that is the point of prayer. That's how they need to respond to the message they've heard today, God. That they need to repent and return to you. They've lost their first love. And they need to, in this Christmas season, come back to the simplicity of the truth of following you and use an opportunity to speak of how you've changed their life. Lord, however it is that we're to respond to the individual person that is here, help us to have the courage to trust you, to respond exactly as you'd call us to do so. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.